All right, so I think folks are settled in mostly. We should get started. Uh, a few people may come in who have gotten lunch now. Uh, my name is Jim Cavallaro. I'm uh, very happy to welcome you here to another talk in the series on the future of human rights. Uh, before I introduce our guest, Paul Hoffman, I wanted to just remind you about a few upcoming events. On the 6th of May, Professor Rajagopal Balakrishnan, uh, director of the MIT Program on Human Rights, uh, will be speaking on the future of human rights, the rise of the South. That's next Monday. The Monday after that, Ajin Dike, Executive Director of the U.S. Human Rights Network, The Future of Human Rights, Can U.S. Social Movements Leverage International Human Rights Standards? And then on Tuesday, the 21st, the last speaker in this series this quarter will be our own visiting professor, Cesar Rodriguez Garavito, uh, who uh, directs the program on global justice and human rights at the Uniandes University of Los Andes Law School in Bogota, Colombia. And he'll speak about the future of human rights, in particular, environment, networks, and social movements in Latin America and the Global South. So I hope to see you all again at those events uh, where we will also provide lunch. I uh, have to mention that. Uh, a few words about Paul Hoffman, uh, who, for those familiar with alien tort statute litigation, probably needs no uh, introduction at all. He is a, if not the, leading litigator in this area. He's also a partner with the Venice, California firm of Schoenblum, Dissemine, Sepler, Harris, and Hoffman LLP. He's been the lead counsel or co-counsel on essential human rights cases in the U.S., such as Kiobo versus Royal Dutch Petroleum, Sosa versus Alvarez Machain, and Doe versus Unical. He's also on the faculty at the UC Irvine School of Law. Uh, his practice covers, in addition to human rights issues and international human rights litigation, constitutional and civil rights litigation, First Amendment discrimination and privacy litigation. He has been named one of the 100 most influential attorneys in California by the Daily Journal and one of the top trial lawyers in Los Angeles County by the Los Angeles Business Journal. He served as director, legal director of the ACLU Foundation of Southern California and has been on the board of vital human rights organizations such as Amnesty, uh, the ACLU Human Rights Committee, the Center for Justice and Accountability, and the California Committee of Human Rights Watch. Uh, he's also written extensively on human rights issues, and he is co-counsel, along with our very own International Human Rights and Conflict Resolution Clinic in Mamani versus Sanchez de Lozada and Sanchez Versailles, an alien tort statute case which has been up to the 11th Circuit, and which was stayed uh, pending Kyobo. So we, among many others, uh, have been anticipating the Supreme Court decision in Kiobel versus Royal Dutch Petroleum. Uh, we're happy that the court timed its sentence in that case uh, to proceed briefly, Paul's arrival here at Stanford. Uh, we thank them for that. Uh, those of us who lean towards the plaintiff perspective on this interest may not have much else to thank the Supreme Court for in that case, but we may. Uh, and, uh, the, the decision in that case is, is a bit cryptic, as uh, those of you who have read it uh, will know, particularly the uh, deciding vote. And uh, if anyone is able to make sense of that decision and tell us what it means, it is our guest today, Paul Hoffman. So I hope you will all join me uh, in giving him a warm welcome here to Stanford to discuss the future of human rights litigation in US courts after Kyobo. Thanks. Okay, just, um, thanks, Jim. And it's a pleasure to be here. Whether I can make sense of this decision, though, that may be a too tall a task for me. Um, what I thought I would do is, is say a few words about um, alien tort statute litigation before Kiobo, what led up to this. Talk a little bit then about the decision itself, and then um, end with uh, some some thoughts about where we go from here. Um, and. Those of us that do this kind of litigation have been thinking about virtually nothing else since April 17th in terms of what, where we go from here. But I want to tell you where we started. Um, the Alien Tort Statute, for those of you that are not familiar, and I apologize to those of you that know a whole lot more about this, um, was part of the, the Judiciary Act of 1789. So it's part of the first law that Congress passed. Uh, and, it, and it basically gave jurisdiction to the district courts, which were created by that act, um, for claims by non-citizens or aliens 
for torts committed in violation of the law of nations or treaties of the United States. Um, the, the law was not used very much for the first couple of hundred years of American history. Um, and then in a case called Philartiga versus Pena uh, in 1980 in the Second Circuit, the law was, was found to apply to a claim by the father and sister of a young man who had been tortured to death in Paraguay. It, the, the law was found to apply to their claim um, that he had been tortured in violation of the law of nations. And so the, court, the Second Circuit found that there was jurisdiction in the courts of the United States uh, for a claim uh, on behalf of non-citizens who are also non-residents um, and against a defendant who was a Paraguayan national for events that took place in Asuncion, Paraguay. Um, that case uh, led to a, a, a flurry of other cases, in, including cases against Ferdinand Marcos, uh, closer to here, a case against General Suarez Mason, who was one of the main architects of the Dirty War in Argentina, uh, and a number of other cases. Uh, in about the mid-1990s, um, those of us that were involved in this litigation, I've been involved, I wasn't involved in Philartiga, but I got involved <coughs> shortly after Philartiga, and I was one of the counsel in the Suarez Mason cases and Marcos and, and a number of the other cases. Uh, in the mid-1990s, we decided um, to start suing corporations for their complicity in human rights violations that took place abroad. Um, and, and the way that that started, actually, was the way that a lot of cases in, in behalf of human rights victims start. Um, we had a situation in Burma where the French oil company Total and a, and a U.S. oil company, Unical, which has since been swallowed up by Chevron, um, were building a natural gas pipeline, pipeline with the military regime in Burma. And in doing that, they were um, not only committing environmental problems, uh, but they were also engaged in torture and forced labor and extrajudicial execution. Um, and, and the activists that were trying to stop this pipeline or bring attention to it um, went to the, the, the leaders at Unical, the CEO and the chairman of the board, and said, you really should not be involved in this pro project because the project is based on human rights violations. And they went to shareholder meetings, they wrote reports, they named and shamed, they used the media, and the, and the, the project continued to go forward. Um, so the thought then was, well, why not use this body of law that had been created to sue individual torturers in US courts against corporations that were complicit in torture or forced labor? And, and, the, and other human rights violations. So we brought that suit in 1996. Um, and we, we litigated it for a number of years. Uh, and in the middle of that litigation, well, let me start out by saying, in the district court, we survived the motion to dismiss. Um, and, and the court said that there was a claim for aiding and abetting human rights violations that could be brought against corporations under the Alien Tort Statute. Um, then we engaged in discovery, and ultimately we lost the summary judgment when our, when our judge was elevated to the Ninth Circuit, and we got a different judge who thought more narrowly about the scope of the alien tort statute. Um, we went up to the Ninth Circuit and got that summary judgment reversed, uh, and the Ninth Circuit found there was a claim for aiding and abetting against um, corporations that were complicit in human rights violations. Um, and they, but they fought over what the proper standard was and where the claim came from. Was it an international law claim? Was it based on U.S. domestic law? And so the Ninth Circuit took that case on banc to decide that question. And after we argued it on banc, the Supreme Court took another of my cases, which was Sosa versus Alvarez Machine. And as was the case in Kiobo, as soon as the court took Sosa, all of the cases around the country were stayed, both the corporate and the individual cases, um, because everybody understood this was the first time the Supreme Court had made, had taken a case under the Alien Tort Statute. The Bush administration came in heavily against us and, and basically argued that this was a jurisdictional statute that had essentially um, never been implemented by Congress, and that Congress had to create a cause of action any time there was to be a claim under the Alien Tort Statute. And that until Congress acted, um, the, the statute basically was meaningless. 
and had been meaningless from the beginning, from 1789 until Congress acted. They made some other very broad claims about limits on even congressional ability to do this. And they also made the claim that only Congress could decide what the law of nations meant, that the courts had lost that power, um, that customary international law no longer existed after Erie. Um, so there were very broad claims that were made in, in Sosa about that. And, and the particular claim in Sosa had to do with a, a Mexican doctor that had been kidnapped by former Mexican police officers at the behest of the Drug Enforcement Agency. And the reason they kidnapped him is they thought that he was involved in the torture and murder of a US DEA agent in Guadalajara. And so the, the, the claim was that he had been kidnapped, he had been subjected to an arbitrary arrest and detention without authority on Mexican soil, um, and that that violated international law. Um, what wound up happening in Sosa when, the case, when the, court was, the case was finally decided was that all nine justices thought that we should lose. Um, and, and we did lose on uh, the claim for Dr. Alvarez Machine. But six justices, in an opinion written by Justice Souter, um, said that the Alien Tort Statute, although it was jurisdictional, um, Congress, it, when it passed the statute, contemplated that the courts would implement international law without any further action by Congress. Not that Congress couldn't act, but that if it didn't act, um, courts would, in the normal common law way that, that, that the founders were familiar with in 1789, would create causes of action uh, or, or recognize causes of action based on common law for violations of the law of nations. They also found that by this time, by, the, by 2004, um, international human rights had become part of the law of nations, even though it might not have been in 1789 uh, when the law of nations covered things like piracy and attacks on ambassadors and violations of, of safe conduct. Um, by now, there was an international law of human rights, and so, at least some part of that law of human rights could be implemented by courts. And that courts had not lost their ability to determine what customary international law was. They didn't have to wait for Congress, even though the court was very happy to get any guidance from Congress that Congress was willing to give. Um, and, and so they endorsed for the Philadelphia case, they endorsed the Marcos case. Um, but they did so in a way that also made it clear that the court was not clear how far it wanted to go in enforcing the Alien Tort Statute in human rights cases. They came up with what, what we usually refer to as the historical paradigm test, which means that if you're asserting a human rights claim, the evidence that it is universal and obligatory and specific enough to enforce under the Alien Tort Statute has to be the equivalent kind of evidence that would have supported the norms in 1789, like piracy, attacks on ambassadors, later on slavery. Um, and so you have to show that there was a very high degree of international consensus, both about the norm itself and, and what the elements of the norm were, were, and that it applied to the kind of case that you were, you were bringing. Um, as it, uh, there was also a lot of cautionary language in Sosa, so it was clear that the court was taking this first step, which was an important step, and it overcame most of the broadest arguments against the statute. Um, but it was a little unclear about where, where the statute would go, where the, where the court would go in enforcing the statute. And so after uh, Sosa, we, we came back down and sort of in the same mode we're in now as the Kiobel, and there was post-Sosa briefing around the country in all of the cases. Uh, in Doe versus Unical, we wound up settling the case um, at that point. Uh, there are a number of other cases, though, that, that, that were not settled, including a case brought against many of the corporations involved in apartheid South Africa. Um, so that was one case, and that case was dismissed um, in the post-Sosa world. Uh, a number of other cases survived SOSA. Um, and so there was, a, there was continued to be litigation in the post-SOSA era, largely against corporations. And so there were cases against 
to Postman Energy Inc., which is a Canadian corporation for genocide, war crimes, and crimes against humanity in southern Sudan. Basically, that they were complicit in bombing villages in, a, in an oil concession in South Sudan. Um, there were the apartheid cases I've mentioned. Uh, and then there, were, then there was Kiobo and Wiwa. And let me say a few words about, about those two cases now. Um, the first case to be filed was Wiwa versus Royal Dutch Petroleum. And the Wiwa in, in the case is, is the, the, are the relatives of Ken Sarah Wiwa. And uh, Ken, I don't know how many of you have heard of Ken Sarah Wiwa. Okay, so you have, that's great. Um, Ken Sarawu was the leader of a movement in the Agoni region of the Niger Delta in Nigeria, which is the main oil producing area of Nigeria. Um, and the movement was called the Movement for the Survival of the Agoni People. And it was directed at the military dictatorship, which was then run by General Abacha, and also Shell Oil Company, which was the, uh, the oil company that had the concessions in Agoni land. Uh, or Agoni. Um, and uh, what, starting in about 1992, um, Ken Sarawu was able to, to really gain the support of virtually the entire population in Agoni, which is about 600,000 people in that one area. Um, and they rose up, there was one demonstration against Shell that had over 300,000 people, or one out of every two people in, in Agoni rising up to say that Shell should stop the environmental degradation that they had engaged in because the oil operations had created tremendous environmental problems for the people living in Agoni. And that the people of Agoni should have some share in the wealth that was being generated because the wealth was being siphoned off not only by Shell through its operations but by the military dictatorship, a lot of which went to, to Swiss bank accounts. Uh, for the leaders of the regime, and the people of Ogoni got none of it. So it was one of the most poverty-stricken areas of the world. It was subject to uh, environmental degradation. The waters were polluted. There was there were flaring all through the, the area, and they rose up and they tried to deal with that. Um, the response to that, well, well, one, Shell pulled out, so that was a good thing. Um, but the, between Shell, at least according to our allegations, Shell and, um, and the military dictatorship then engaged in a reign of repression against Mossop and activists against Shell's role in Agoni. And that went on uh, in the 1992 to 1995 period is when you had attacks on, 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 on activists and others that were engaged in demonstrations. You had people being shot. You had people being put in detention um, and tortured. Um, and, and most spectacularly, the regime hung Ken Sarawiwa and eight others who became known as the Agoni Nine in November 1995. Um, the Wiwa versus Shell case was filed in the beginning of 1996, uh, a few months after the, um, the executions of the Agoni Nine. And these were executions that were protested by the Clinton administration, by Nelson Mandela, by the United Nations. I mean, it was widely recognized that, that they had been convicted in an unfair trial and they were being hung because of their opposition to the regime and to Shell's activities in, in Agoni. Um, so when it was filed, and, uh, and initially, and it was filed against the parent corporations of Shell uh, Oil. Uh, and those parent corporations, one of them was a UK company, one of them was a, a Netherlands company. And the argument was that they did enough, they had enough of a presence in New York, including being listed on the stock exchange and having an investor um, services office, that there was general personal jurisdiction and that with general personal jurisdiction you could sue them for the violations that their Nigerian subsidiary was complicit in in, in Nigeria. Uh, and initially that, that argument was lost and the case was dismissed on personal jurisdiction and forum non-convenience grounds. That it was better to, to, that the cases should have been brought in Europe uh, where the parents um, were, were based. Uh, that was overturned by the Second Circuit in 2000. Um, and, and the Second Circuit said no, the, 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 uh, after Florida, the courts of the United States played a special role in providing a forum um, for human rights claims. 
And, and there was some uh, particular justice in, in, uh, in, in that decision, at least with respect to the Kiobo plaintiffs. The Kiobo plaintiffs were all um, people, were lower level Mossop um, activists. And they had been subjected to torture and detention and the like. Um, they had all come to the United States with the assistance of the US government and had gotten political asylum because of the human rights violations that they suffered in Nigeria. And so they had come and they were all US residents. In fact, a number of them have become US citizens since. And when they came, they saw Shell, Shell oil stations, right? Wherever they live, in Missouri and other places, they'd say, well, they're here, right? Just like home. Um, and since none of them spoke Dutch and didn't know any Dutch lawyers, um, they took advantage of the legal system here and the ATS jurisprudence. And so that another case was filed um, for these people on behalf of a putative class of people that had, um, had suffered these violations in the 1992 to 1995 period. Now, the, the cases then, there was, a, there was heavy discovery in both of the cases. Um, discovery in Nigeria, discovery in London, discovery in, in the Netherlands. Um, and then eventually, um, we were able to survive summary judgment motions in WIWA, and we settled that case on the verge of trial in June of 2009 uh, for $15.5 million on behalf of 10 plaintiffs. Um, the Kiobo case took a different turn, and as, it tur as it's turned out, a very strange turn. Um, the motion to dismiss in that case had been delayed because of all the proceedings in WIWA. And finally, the, set of the judge, who was the judge in both of these cases, denied, for the most part, Shell's motion to dismiss. And this is about, I think, 2005-ish. Um, but for reasons known only to her, decided to, to grant an interlocutory appeal. And so there was an interlocutory appeal, and the issues were, were claims like torture, extrajudicial killing, and the other claims in the case actionable after Sosa versus Alvarez machine? Now, most courts had decided pretty easily that they were, but she decided to send that up to the Second Circuit. Well, when we got to the Second Circuit, we argued about those questions, um, and we waited for a decision. Uh, and it took about a year and a half to get the decision, and maybe almost two years, to get the decision in Kiobel. And when Kiobel came down in October of 2011, and it came down on the issue, the two members of the panel decided that corporations could not be sued under the Alien Tort Statute, which was the first time any court had ever held that. And there are all these corporate cases around the country. Shell had never argued that. We had never briefed it. We had never argued it in the Second Circuit. We argued about these other issues. Um, and so we looked at that and we thought, well, you know, this, is, this is interesting. <laughs> um, and there was a, a vigorous dissent by Judge Laval, you know, basically saying that the majority had completely ignored existing alien tort statute jurisprudence and, and was off on, a, on, on this attempt to destroy the statute, basically, um, which is true. Um, and, um, and so we filed a petition for rehearing. Actually, we wanted to just call it a petition for hearing in the first instance. Um, but there is no such thing. So we, we filed a, a, um, a petition for rehearing. We lost that five to five. You have to have a majority to get it. So we, we, it was equal, evenly divided. There are a bunch of additional opinions where they accused each other backwards and forwards of, 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 of not doing the right thing and uh, making political decisions. And actually, Chief Justice Jacobs' opinion made it very clear that his objection to the case was he just didn't think corporations should ever be sued as a policy matter. Um, and uh, Judge Cabana said, no, 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 this is a legal question, not a policy matter. Anyway, so we, we decided to file a, a cert petition. Um, and the reason we decided to file a cert petition, for those of you that might say, well, why did you, why did you want to bring this case to the Supreme Court? or any case to the Supreme Court. Um, basically, it was because our, this was our client's only chance to win. Right? Their, com, their, their compatriots had just settled the case for $15.5 million, and their only chance of getting compensation for their wrongs was going to the Supreme Court. And we also thought that the, the Second Circuit's decision that there was no corporate liability 
was so clearly wrong on the law that we would have a pretty decent chance of winning in the Supreme Court back when I was young and naive about things like that. Um, so we, we filed that cert petition, and then in October of 2011, I guess it was, wow, it was, we, was it 11 or 12? Must be 11. Um, it was granted. And we, we argued in February of, uh, of last year, right? I'm starting to lose it here. I'm just an old guy. Um, so we argued this, and then within, I was told that the Roberts Court, and this is the first time I'd argued in the Roberts Court. I'd argued four times before in the court, but I was told that, that you got a minute to explain what your case was before they started showering you with, with questions. I got 11 seconds, I think. I mean, about 11 seconds, and halfway into my second sentence, um, Justice Kennedy started to ask me a question about extraterritoriality, basically. And then Justice Alito said, well, your opening of your brief says these are Nigerian plaintiffs and Nigerian defendants, and it all happened in Nigeria. Why is this case here? And so we started having an argument about extraterritoriality. Now, meanwhile, the show had never raised the issue of extraterritoriality throughout the whole litigation. I mean, there was a little part of their, their opposition brief in the Supreme Court that mentioned it, but only as an alternative ground. So we were prepared to argue corporate liability, basically for the first time, because we never really got to argue it before. So I then switched. And at some point in this argument, I said, well, if you really want to talk about extraterritoriality, why don't you ask for more briefing, thinking, well, that's a good way maybe to get off the hot seat. They'll never do that, right? Um, well, lo and behold, I go home after this argument um, thinking this was a pretty strange argument that we were supposed to be arguing about corporate liability and we never seemed to do that. Um, and, and I slept for about three days. Uh, and then on Monday morning, first day I go back into my office, I get a call from the court and they say, well, we'd like you to come back again. <laughs> you know, he reads me this order that says, well, the court has asked for re-argument on the question of whether uh, and to what extent ATS claims can be based on events that take place on the territory of a foreign sovereign. So we do the drill all over again. So there's another 50 amicus briefs. And by the end of it, about 100 amicus briefs on all these issues. And, and we argue the first, we were the first argument of the term, October 1. Um, of last year. And so we wait and we wait and we wait. And on uh, uh, April 17th, uh, we got an answer. And uh, what did they say about corporate liability? They didn't say anything about corporate liability. Um, but they, find, they found, well, all nine of them found that, our, that this case should not be in US courts. Um, and you've got, basically you've got Justice, Chief Justice Roberts writing for the majority. Right? And Chief Justice Roberts, the first three sections of opinion are the presumption against extraterritoriality and basically arguing that the alien tort statute should not be read to apply to events that take place on foreign territory. Sort of making it seem like it's really the presumption against extraterritoriality that he's talking about. But actually, he's, in my view at least, he's not really talking about the presumption against extraterritoriality, and I think he recognizes that. Because the presumption against extraterritoriality is a doctrine that says that Congress should be assumed not to legislate substantive standards extraterritorially unless it's clear that they've intended to do that. Well, number one, this is a jurisdictional statute. It's never been applied to jurisdictional statutes. It's about the courts creating cause of action. It's never been applied to courts. It's only been applied to Congress. And usually if the statute, usually if the presumption doesn't apply, it either applies or it doesn't apply. And so they had a problem. There's piracy. If, it, if, if, if a statute applies to the high seas, there's a line of cases that says that the presumption just doesn't apply. And it's all or nothing. I mean, it's either it's, either it's only on the US territory and, and it, and it and nowhere else. Or if it's on the high seas, it's everywhere else. Um, and so what the way of distinguishing piracy was to say, well, we really can't figure out how to distinguish piracy, so it must be different. Basically, that's what they say. Do I seem bitter? 
No, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I don't want to. I don't want to seem too bitter on this, but but it's kind of a ridiculous analysis, I think. Um, but we have so what 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 Robert, so that's Robert's first three sections. On the other end of the spectrum, you've got Breyer writing for four justices, um, the four liberals, um, although not all that liberal in this case, um, basically saying, well, we should we should use established international law standards. Um, under established international law standards, there's really not enough of a connection to the United States in this case, because this is a case based on mere corporate presence. The parents have some presence in the United States, but really nothing happened here. And so the United States doesn't really have an interest in providing a forum for these kind of plaintiffs. Now, they sort of gloss over the fact that we've, they've got political asylum here, and that's why, but, but that's, that, that's what they say. Uh, but at least it's an attempt uh, to try to create a structure for future cases. Um, and then in the middle, you've got Kennedy, which is what we always knew. Right? Both sides were vying for Kennedy. And in fact, if you read these opinions, you can see that Brown is writing his opinion more conservatively than he probably otherwise would. And Roberts is, is, is writing his opinion, scaling it back to get Kennedy's vote. Um, and in section four of the opinion, um, the Roberts opinion, Basically, what Roberts writes for the majority is that um, this is a case about mere corporate presence. It's about this case. Um, if there's another case that touches and concerns the territory of the United States with sufficient force, maybe that would be a different question. And you've got Alito and his concurrence saying, well, yes, this is a very narrow decision. We would actually have a different rule that says that the events giving rise to the violation have to occur on US territory underscoring the fact that the majority is not saying that, right? And Kennedy's opinion basically says, uh, this is a very narrow opinion that the majority has, has done. Um, and there may be other cases, other ATS cases, um, where the rationale and the holding of this opinion don't apply. And in those cases, we might have to tell you something about the presumption of extraterritoriality. So basically what you've got, I think, out of this opinion, and this is the segue really to you know, whether I have to do tax litigation from now on or, or human rights litigation, is that what I think happened here is they all didn't like this case. They didn't think that a case involving Nigerian plaintiffs and, Niger and, and foreign defendants for things that happened a long time ago in Nigeria um, where the only reason that there was personal jurisdiction over these, the, the parents were that they were doing business on the stock exchange. That was too broad a use of the alien tort statute for all of them, but particularly for Kennedy. And so, but they also, Kennedy in particular, I think, did not want to say how far he thinks the alien tort statute goes. In the first argument, he seemed to indicate in his statements that he thought Sosa was good law, and there's nothing in Kiobel that undermines Sosa, at, at least explicitly. Um, and and Florida was good law. Florida being the case involving foreign plaintiffs, foreign defendants, something that happened a long time ago in Paraguay. Right? But the difference there is that, um, and he said this in the argument, was that the only place you could sue Peña Arela, the defendant, was the United States, because that's where he was. He had gotten safe harbor in the United States. And you can't really say that about corporations because you could go sue them where they live. And that for, for Kennedy was a, seemed to be, in the argument at least, something that, that mattered to him. So now the question is, for the future on, on alien tort statute litigation is, you know, does Florida survive? You know, is because is, they're basically the same situation, right? Florida cases usually are events that take place outside the United States. Usually they're, well, they have to be foreign plaintiffs because the Alien Tort Statute only allows for foreign plaintiffs or non-citizen plaintiffs. Um, and, um, and, so the, and, and, and the defendants are usually people that have committed these acts abroad and have come, either come to the United States permanently like Marcos and, and Peñarell and some others, or you've been able to get tag jurisdiction over them. I think the tag jurisdiction cases are going to be in trouble. The cases where the only basis for personal jurisdiction is 
you've served somebody while they're coming through the United States. I think that's gonna, those are going to be tough sells after Kiobo, probably. Um, I think that the Florida safe haven cases are probably good, are still going to survive because I think the U.S. there's a there's a strong U.S. connection there. The United States is providing safe haven uh, for people that have been accused of human rights violations. Um, the the big battleground in this area is whether U.S. corporations are going to be found liable for what they or their subsidiaries do outside the United States. And, and that's the thing that's been clearly left open by Kiobo. And in fact, that's the majority of the cases that are pending. The apartheid cases have both. The apartheid cases have some US defendants and some foreign corporate defendants. Uh, there are cases against Chiquita for arming um, death squads in Colombia. Um, there are cases against Drummond for doing the same in Guatemala and Colombia. Uh, there are cases against Occidental Petroleum for their involvement in a war crime in Colombia. Uh, Occidental is a U.S. company. Um, there's a case against Nestle and some other um, chocolate makers for child slave labor in Ivory Coast. Two of the three defendants are U.S. corporations. One is a Swiss corporation. Um, and so. The court's going to have the the lower courts are going to have to wrestle with whether being a U.S. corporation is touches and concerns the territory of the United States with sufficient force to make them susceptible to ATS claims. Um, there's also some question about whether there's a substantive uh, element to the Kiobo decision. There doesn't seem to be on the face of it, but. It could be that, that the court will treat genocide claims differently from claims of arbitrary detention, for example. And the Kiobo claims, although they're terrible, are, on, are, are not on the most severe end of the spectrum in terms of the cases that have been brought. Um, and so you might have a different attitude by the courts if you had, for example, a modern day IG Farben that's a foreign corporation uh, but you could get that. You could sue them here. Or say you had um, you were able to get the the uh, pirates Inc. from Somalia, you know, where the money is here, but the pirates are in Somalia. Uh, I suspect that the court might look differently on a case like that if the only place you could get redress was in the United States, and you couldn't go to Somalia to get the pirates because it's it's not safe, or it it, it would not be the kind of thing where you'd have to exhaust local remedies. Um, so, the, so these are the open issues under the Alien Tort Statute. Um, and, I, and I think even based on the rationale of the Roberts opinion, um, the Roberts opinion leaves open, I think, whether US defendants or defendants that have a much stronger connection to the United States might be susceptible to suit under the Alien Tort Statute. But of course, nobody really knows, right? Because it all depends on what Kennedy wants, right? I mean, it really is down to what Kennedy wants. And, and so my sense is that it's a negative that Kennedy joined the Roberts opinion, right? Because he, he could have joined either opinion, and we still would have lost. Um, but he was clearly not willing at this point to join an opinion that laid out a structured way to approach these questions based on international law. He was just not willing to do that yet. Um, and he was willing to go along with a, an opinion that, that puts a presumption against extraterritoriality in the way of bringing these claims. So the first thing you're arguing about is not an even playing field. You start out with this wall that you have to jump over in order to bring these cases. Um, that's, you know, we're kind of familiar with jumping over walls in alien tort statute cases, but it's clearly a negative thing that he did that. But fortunately, he did so in such a narrow way that I think even the other side, and, and most of the people that are doing work on the other side, recognize that this is a, a decision that basically punted. I mean, you had thousands of pages of briefs, right, written on almost everything you could conceivably write about in this area. And then they decided with this you know, tiny little opinion that talks about the presumption against extraterritoriality. So you know, it's clear that they, they, they do not have a stable five-person majority about what this statute means. And Kennedy was one of the votes in SOSA. 
So I think he's not, he's not inclined to overturn Sosa. So the question is what happens in the future? And I think you know, for the next two or three years, we're going to bang our heads against the wall and, and bring, continue to, to, in fact, and we've already been hit with briefing deadlines that start May 10th. In the apartheid case, we have to file our brief by May 10th and Doe versus Exxon May 17th. Um, and there are cases that involve virtually every conceivable fact pattern relating to corporate liability. And there are cases like Mamani that deal with the Florida Gatet cases. Um, so there's going to be a bevy of, of decisions, and the question is whether the court is really interested in resolving any of them, or they're just going to sit there for a while and, and let us duke it out until some agreement in the circuits comes to be about what the statute means. And I, you know, who knows what will happen. I mean, we've been in the middle of an ideological divide about the role of courts, the role of international law. Does international law exist? Is it real? Is it not real? Um, you know, the, the kinds of things that divide um, courts even in other areas as well. And, and you know, the role of courts. Uh, it, clearly the Roberts opinion is such that he's saying, well, we don't really believe in international law, and only if Congress really, really tells us that we have to enforce it, we're going to do it. And, and the other side of it is, well, no, that's the Congress already made that decision by passing the Alien Tort Statute, and it meant what it said. And it's up to the courts to, to, imp, to implement it, which is really the, the, the spirit of SOSA was the founders wanted us to do this. We still can do this. It's hard, but we're going to try to do it. The, the spirit of the Kiobo majority is we don't want to deal with this. If we can possibly avoid it, Congress, please do something or go to Congress and, and do it. Everybody knows that saying you go to Congress means that nothing happens, right? Because nothing's going to happen in Congress. The only things that are going to happen, uh, just to, and then I'll wrap up so I can answer your questions, is that um, there is the Torture Victim Protection Act, and, and that was uh, the, dis the case involving the Torture Victim Protection Act was argued. Um, was argued uh, last term uh, by Jeff Fisher uh, from, from Stanford. And um, the, the, in that case, they found that the TVPA did not apply to corporate defendants. But it does apply to individuals. So we can sue, at least for torture and extrajudicial killing, we can sue corporate executives for doing that. And in some of the cases have already amended their complaints to bring, case, bring claims against the individual corporate executives which I think they'll actually like a lot less than the corporate cases in a lot of ways. Um, so we have that. Um, all the cases that um, against US corporations can be brought under diversity jurisdiction. And so there'll be a whole body, there'll be another fight over the, the federal courts um, interpreting common law claims in federal courts under diversity jurisdiction. And then there's gonna be state court litigation. And there, already have, there are already a lot of state claims in many of these cases. In Doe versus Unical, we settled on the verge of a trial in LA Superior Court after the ATS claims had been, had been dismissed. And so there's lots of scope for bringing state law claims. And so the bottom line of this is that, you know, it's not clear what's going to be left of the ATS in corporate cases. I think that's a big open question, and we'll be fighting that for the next few years until the Supreme Court, or Kennedy, rather, decides. Um, but in the meantime, the cases are going to get brought. Um, and, and, you know, because there, there are people being victimized with corporate complicity in lots of different places. Uh, a lot of those defendants can be sued in the United States. Um, these cases pose different kinds of challenges. I mean, for example, a lot of defendants have argued something called the Foreign Affairs Doctrine, arguing that, um, that, that cases in state court are preempted by the national interest in foreign affairs. Now, there's no real case law to support that, but you know, I would have told you they wouldn't have been able to use the presumption against extraterritoriality either, and so my predictions are not worth as much, probably. Um, the only prediction I can make that's clear is that, you know, is that we will continue to sue. Um, and that there's a corporate accountability movement that won't be stopped by this decision. And, and also, I think that the, the decision, the, the public reaction to decision is that the court wiped us out. And that just clearly is not so. I mean, the, I think that the, 
the media sometimes doesn't understand the intricacies of, of often doesn't understand the intricacies of decision, particularly in this area. Um, they also said after Sosa that we had been wiped out, and that clearly did not turn out to be true. But it, it, it is certainly true that this court has five justices on it that are at a minimum uncertain about how far courts should go in enforcing international norms. And we're going to be butting up against that as long as we have this court. Um, and even the other four are certainly not willing to accept our arguments completely. But why don't I stop there so that you have some time to ask me some questions and I will tell you no lies. All right, thank Maybe. you. So we have a mic here. Uh, we're recording, so we'll pass this around to whoever uh, would like to ask a question. State your name if you would. And question away. If not, I have a question. I'll start with a question. I'll jump the queue. So I'm wondering, and this is, may take you into the area of speculation, but uh, I thought I was there already. Yeah, well, <laughs> I'm curious before we move on to the future of what you think happened in Kiobo. Uh, you're, pre you're presenting an, an argument, you get, you think that the case was taken so that the corporate uh, defendant issue can be addressed, and then the court it takes a turn and issues a decision which is highly unclear. Do you think that there was an interest in resolving the corporate issue? Then uh, the idea that maybe addressing extraterritoriality might be more effective than a failure to get a majority for it? I mean, what, what, what do you think is happening? I and mean, if you, if you probably don't have to speculate. Yeah, no, why not? It's cheap. I can, <laughs> it doesn't cost me anything probably. Um, I mean, my, my feeling is they didn't have five votes to say there was no corporate liability. I mean, one other thing is the United States government came in on our side on corporate liability and came in on the Shell side on extraterritoriality. And that may have had some impact on them. Um, also, the arguments for no corporate liability were, were, were just so weak, it seemed to me, um, that they probably had, would have had a hard time coming up with an analysis that, you know, passed the laugh test, I think. Um, plus, the, there were decisions in three other circuits after um, the Second Circuit finding that there was corporate liability. So I think that, you know, the, the, my sense is that they, they had unease about the case, right? They didn't like the case. That was clear from the beginning. Um, and I think they were struggling to find a way to do away with this case and cases like it. Um, and they haven't quite figured out where they want to draw the line. So this was the best way they could come up with to do away with this. And also, I think, to signal that you know, this, they're, they're not ending at this. I mean, I think that there are going to be some other cases that are going to get squeezed out of the system by this court if they get a chance to, to do it. But they also, I think, were concerned that I don't think they wanted to say, and I think they still, they still think they don't want to say, that if there's another IG Farben, you can't bring that case here. You know, the, the, you can't make Zyklon B and, I mean, the, the, I ended my rebuttal in the second argument with a hypothetical about, you know, a company that was assisting the current Syrian, Syrian regime in, uh, in, po in using poison gas against its citizens and that you know, the victims of that came to the United States like our plaintiffs did. Um, and the question was, you know, are you really saying that you can't bring that lawsuit? And I don't think Kennedy was prepared to say you couldn't. I think, they would, I think a majority of the, of the court would find that that is a perfectly appropriate use of the Alien Tort Statute. But I don't think they're quite sure about how to write those opinions. And so right now, and certainly Kennedy, I mean, Kennedy says absolutely nothing about what he thinks about the statute in his opinion. Absolutely nothing, right? So he's, you know, he's clearly playing his cards close to his vest. Okay, so I see several questions here. Let's uh, start here, move back. I have you all questions out and ask some questions? It doesn't matter, I could do it one at a time. Well, I have two, so. Because I forget. <laughs> <laughs> I might not even remember the second, the first one. Uh, well, the first one is, what is it, what do you think it means that they took certain in Daimler? Mm -hmm. um, and the second one is from your, you know, in your history of doing this, I know that there have been several, 
high value settlements. And I, I guess Doe was a non-disclosed amount, but I understand. But I, my assumption is that it was also a high value. Um, Pretty good. Uh, what, do you th what have you seen corporations do at all to change practices as a result of the litigation? And do you think that this changes those practices? Do you think that the decision in Cuba will? It's a great, it's a good it? question. Um, well, let, let me go to the first one first. Um, the Daimler case um, has to do with personal jurisdiction rather than the ATS. It is an ATS case, and it's a suit against Daimler for what its subsidiary did in Argentina during the dirty war on a, uh, in a Daimler plant in Buenos Aires, mainly. Um, <laughs> The Ninth Circuit came up with a, a personal jurisdiction decision that, you know, arguably is, is farther out than this court is willing to go in personal jurisdiction. And so, you know, the best scenario, I suppose, is if they don't like that case, that they're just going to decide it based on personal jurisdiction grounds. And they have been cutting back on personal jurisdiction, particularly with respect to corporations and corporate subsidiaries in a number of cases not involving human rights. So I don't see it necessarily as a human rights decision. I think it's probably going to be more of a personal jurisdiction decision, which will have an impact on human rights cases, right? But I don't see them using the Daimler case as a, as a, as a way to further explicate what they think about the alien tort statute. Right, and so I, I think it's going to wind up being a personal jurisdiction case, uh, and it's in good hands. It's here at the Stanford Clinic, um, and on the on the second issue, you know, I've been told by the folks that do corporate accountability work, non-litigation work, people like John Ruggie and others, um, that the ATS litigation has been very helpful. You know, because it's a kind of you need some kind of club to get corporations sometimes to do, um, to, to do what they need to do in this area. And so to the extent that the club becomes a stick, you know, a little stick, <laughs> depending on how little it is, um, you know, then obviously that's going to be less of a, of a club to, to nail them with. Now, will that change the movement? You know, I don't know. You know, my guess is that if you don't have clubs, then you get less action, generally. And that's been my experience. Now, hopefully, the corporate accountability movement has enough other weapons um, that it will continue to thrive. Because I think it has, it's going in the right direction, but it's got a long way to go. And, and so it may depend also on, on whether these other ways of going will be helpful. I mean, we'll, if we suit them under the TVPA, sue them in state courts, sue them under diversity, you know, maybe we can continue to hold their feet to the fire in ways that, um, that will help in that. Because this whole litigation, and, and, I, and it, you know, one of the reasons that we decided to do corporate cases um, was not that we thought that litigation would change the world in any significant way itself. We really wanted to inspire, you know, international regulatory action. Uh, we wanted to support the work that was being done by activists and others around the world trying to demand corporate accountability um, and use the litigation as litigation sometimes can be used as a catalyst for, for those larger efforts. And those are the efforts that really matter, I think. You know, we'll just keep slugging it out and trying to help. Ah. So I have a question about um, exhaustion of remedies. So I know the TVPA includes um, right. the exhaustion of domestic remedies requirement, and I know there was speculation um, that the court in Cuba might import that. Right. Um, and they didn't. So I was wondering, do you think the court might do that in the future, or are there other ways that the court that you think the court might try to curb the ATS? Yes. <laughs> you want me to say more? Um, well, the the. Um, yeah, there, there hasn't been an exhaustion requirement in the ATS, generally speaking. The Ninth Circuit um, came up with one in Sarai versus Rio Tinto, um, a form of exhaustion of, of local remedies, um, kind of modified. In Sosa, the court said that it would consider an exhaustion of remedies requirement in one of the footnotes. I think it was footnote 21. And, and so... 
that's always been on the table, and it's sort of before the Ninth Circuit and Sarai again, because Sarai was up on a cert petition, and they they sent it back for further proceedings and um, consistent with Kiobo. We offered exhaustion of, the, of domestic remedies, basically, in the argument. We made a tactical decision in October to, to basically say the way you do, if you want to deal with this problem, use exhaustion of local remedies as the way to do it. Justice Sotomayor asked me a question based on the, the brief that the European Union had filed where they had made that argument. And we basically wrapped ourselves around the European Union brief, even though that's not really where we had been prior. But our, our sense of where the court was was that that might be the best way to, to resolve this. And obviously they went farther. Roberts went farther than that. Um, and that wasn't enough to bring Kennedy over to that, to that side. And I don't know why. I mean, I still suspect that they will impose an exhaustion of local uh, remedies requirement. But, you know, it's anybody's guess. And it's also anybody's guess what it would look like. I mean, the TVPA, there's the TVPA exhaustion of local remedies. There's international law exhaustion of local remedies. And then there are the various, you know, formulations of exhaustion that were laid out in the briefs, some of which go far beyond anything that's international law. Like you have to exhaust every place you might be able to sue somebody before you come to the United States. So it's hard to say what they're going to do. And it may be that one of the reasons they decided not to do it was that they weren't sure it would wipe out this case or cases like it, and they weren't sure what it would look like, you know, and didn't want to didn't want to adopt the TVPA one. I don't. It's hard, you know that's pure speculation, but I, I wouldn't be surprised that there would be other limiting principles of ATS cases as we go along. Okay. Other questions? Mm. And there was a question. Another question back there. Uh, thank you very much. I had two uh, questions also following Claire's lead here. Uh, the first question was about, you talked about the decision to file the cert petition in Kyobo and, and about how this was the last kind of opportunity for the victims to have some redress. So I'm curious if you can talk about the trade-off that you weigh when um, deciding about the merits of a particular case versus kind of the larger impact of, a, of, uh, of an issue or of a statute and, and how a decision could, could impact other um, future litigants and how you weigh those trade-offs. And my second question is a, is a much more general question, although that's pretty general too, is um, if you were a young attorney in law school understanding human rights, how would you weigh the decision to go the litigation route versus, you know, kind of fact-finding, um, ad legal advocacy, and, and how do you see the interplay and interaction between those two tools? Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, on the... Um so I tell you, I always forget. Well, let me let me start with the second one then. <laughs> um, the the you know I think that there is interplay between all of those things. I mean, I always use Florida as the best example of that. In Florida, um, it was based on the fact that torture was viewed to be um, a, a prohibition under customary international law. But where did they get that? They got it in part from the 1975 Declaration Against Torture that the UN General Assembly had passed. Well, how did that come about? The 1992 International Campaign Against Torture that Amnesty organized. And where was that based on? That was based on fact-finding and you know, you know, basic human rights work. And so you had all this human rights. You had people dealing with individual cases and trying to deal with them and then saying, wait a second, there's a larger problem here, let's put that together, we'll put in a report. What are we asking for? Well, we're asking for UN action and plus a bunch of other things. And, and that then found its way into a place where litigators like me could use it. And since Florida, the same thing has been true in every other area where we've been successful. That, that we ba you cannot be a successful human rights litigator without having this entire movement that's generating the norms and the the kind of international political culture that helps you in these in these kinds of efforts, the media, the support in the public generally. You know, I think all those things really matter. Now, you know, I think what you decide to do for your own career, you know, depends on what you like to do. You know, I like suing people. <laughs> you know, so, you know, maybe I'm just so used to it that, you know, that's uh, 
you know, I've spent my whole career doing that, and so that's my comparative advantage in this in this field. But I've also been, you know, I've been on the board of Amnesty on and off for you know thirty years, and I've been chair, and I've given speeches around the world, and done missions, and written human rights reports, and you know, done all the other parts too. But I, you know, I've tended to gravitate, at least certainly in this period of my life, you know, I'm probably going to go out fighting the good fight on litigation. Uh, but, it, you know, if you're a, a young person who's trying to do it, I would try to find ways to know about all the different facets of international human rights advocacy. You know, if I were, if I were someone doing that. I'd, in all the different ways you can do that by working someplace during the summer, by getting a job for a couple of years as a, as a fellow, you know, working, what? Or, or taking a clinic. And actually, that's, you know, I do a clinic at UCI, and, and one of the ways I try to do it is to make sure that people are involved not only in litigation, but involved in other kinds of activities, too. Now, well, remind me your first question, because... I try that, friend. Okay, now I, I'm, I'm with you now. Um, I mean, I, I've been dealing with this problem my whole life as a litigator, because, you know, as a, it's not different as an international human rights litigator than being a civil rights litigator. Um, you know, once you take a case, it's your client's interests that prevail, period. That's just the way it is. So if your client's interests are to take the case to the Supreme Court, it's over, right? I mean, it's over. Unless you have clients who share your view of what's needed, right? And there are a lot of clients like that. I mean, when I was an ACLU lawyer, I represented organizations that had similar you know, interests, and so they could decide whether or not to take a particular case based on litigation strategy. And, and, and when you do that, then the, there's an alignment between your client's interests and yours. And you try to get clients that, that from the beginning, who are interested in the larger picture, rather than just making a buck. And we've been pretty lucky with, with that, actually. Um, but ultimately, you know, how could we say to these clients, you know, you should give up because we're afraid that the Supreme Court's gonna, gonna do something really bad? How do you do that? I think it's pretty easy, a pretty easy choice in this, in this case. And sometimes it just doesn't work out. But it's not clear that if it didn't work out, I mean, it might have been another case where it didn't work out, you know, and then, so how do you know? You know, if, if one vote, right? Kennedy, just a little bit over here, you know, would, have been, would have been fine. Last question here. Thank you. Um, I'm doing some research around uh, transnational behavior, specifically internal organizational behavior in relation to human rights resources and uh, human rights policies. And uh, so particular interests are around cult as an organizational behavior, internalized system. And the other one is around um, the, the notion of human resource policies or even choice and law. Do you have any perspectives on that? I'm not sure that I understand it. Completely. Okay, so um, looking at transnationals, so I found it interesting that you were saying that corporate or person, that the corporations shouldn't be sued. And so I understand, at least in the United States, that cults are tolerated. Whereas what was the word? Cults, C-O-L-T-S, cults. Okay, yeah, that's where I was losing it. Yeah. Uh -huh. So do you want to know my Do you have any experience or perspective broadly from our style and our litigation? Yeah, I guess I'm, I'm still in a little bit of trouble um, honing in on exactly what you want. Um, you know, I don't, I don't have a lot of experience with how it works within corporations. Um, you know, my, basically my experience is bringing these lawsuits and having people tell me that it works within corporations um, to, to, you know, where, the, where they're advised by their lawyers not to do certain things, that they maybe avoid a particular project because the human rights cost is too high and that they're afraid that they're going to get sued. Because it's not just about suing them and them having to pay a judgment or having to pay legal fees. It's also about what happens when they get accused in a lawsuit of, of 
in get, being engaged in genocide, for example? You know, are their shares going to go down? In Unical, that was a big issue. Are pension funds going to divest from them because of the allegations in the suit? Once you get um, discovery, is it possible to lay out, to show that they've lied about, about their human rights policies, for example, which they, at least in the cases I've done, they do. And so when, when that hypocrisy is shown, what, what's the cost to them, to their brand, to their, to their operation? So I don't know if that answers your question, but I mean, I, I think that you know, my experience, at least, is that the cases often can have those impacts. Um, do they always have the impacts? You know, we've, we haven't done any empirical work about that. I mean, it's really anecdotal, both in terms of our own experience, in terms of what people tell us about it. But I certainly see there's this whole industry. You know, I've put all these lawyers' kids through colleges, probably suing the companies that they represent. Um, you know, and I think what they do is they, they advise their clients about the current state of the law and how you avoid getting into those tangles. And I think that helps, right? I mean, it seems to me that if, if you can prevent them from getting involved in a bad project, that's a good thing. But of course, someone else would say, well, then the Chinese will do it, or someone else will do it that's not governed by the ATS. And that's a, that's a pretty serious issue. Uh, Amanda, we're going to ask uh, some of you have uh, follow-up questions. Uh, Paul may be generous with uh, a bit of time immediately after we switch up to that. Okay. Uh, otherwise, it's 2 o'clock. We're going to wrap up. Please join me in thanking our guest, Paul. <laughs>